Good morning. Uh, it's uh, truly my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Chris Walsh, as the 2021 Story Landis Lecturer. Chris is currently Chief of the Division of Genetics and Genomics at Boston Children's Hospital, the Bullard Professor of Pediatrics and Neurology at Harvard Medical School, an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a member of the Broad Institute, and director of the Allen Discovery Center of Human Brain Evolution. Chris received his MD PhD degrees from the University of Chicago, where his PhD advisor was Rainer Guillory. He was then a resident in neurology at Mass General Hospital in Boston and did a research postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School with Connie Sepko as his, PhD, as his uh, advisor for his postdoc. And it's where I met Chris and I will just like to thank him publicly for our discussions that got me involved in studying early brain development. So Chris has been at the Harvard Medical School his entire career, as well as uh, Boston Children's Hospital as chief of the Division of Genetics since 2005. In addition, he's been an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute since 2002. The theme of his research over the past 25 years has been to understand the normal development of the cerebral cortex and to better understand causes and mechanisms of developmental disorders that affect the human cerebral cortex. He's published more than 260 primary papers in all the top journals and nearly 100 reviews, chapters, and editorials. Among his many awards and honors are he's an elected member or fellow of the Association of American Physicians, American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2021, he was awarded the Gruber, Gruber Prize in Neuroscience with Christine Petit. So please join me in virtually welcoming Chris as this year's Story Landis Lecture. The title of his talk is Somatic Mutation and Genomic Diversity in Human Brain in Development, Aging, and Disease. Chris, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Tony, and thanks, uh, Eleni, and everyone for the opportunity. It's a real privilege to be asked to deliver the Story Landis Lecture. Uh, can people hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I still remember reading some of her amazing papers on neurotransmitter plasticity when I was a graduate student, uh, but also as the husband of an academic physician and the father of two daughters interested in science, I've just been reflecting on what an incredible pioneer she was to be so incredibly successful in science uh, at that time. Uh, when it was even more than today dominated by sort of the white males. Um, and so I hope that the comments I make today uh, illustrate in some small way the medical importance of studying uh, neurodevelopment, which is, I know, something that uh, Story has always understood so well. And, and uh, also, it's a real pleasure to be introduced by my old friend Tony. We are postdocs together, as he said. We are collaborators on a PO1, uh, and I, I can't say how many uh, fascinating conversations we've had about science uh, over the years. Uh, so um, with that, I guess I'll dive in. And today I'll be talking uh, about uh, somatic mutations in the brain. So somatic mutations are familiar uh, for people interested in cancer. They're defined essentially as mutations that are present in some cells in the body, uh, but not all cells in the body. And I'll use terms like mosaic mutations and somatic mutations and clonal mutations more or less synonymously. Uh, just refer to, as I say, mutations that occur in a dividing cell during development or at some point, and then those mutations are inherited by the daughter cells of that original progenitor cell. And so they can occur at any time during normal development. As I say, they're familiar from cancer, but we now know that they cause an increasingly long list of developmental conditions uh, and uh, can predispose uh, potentially to all sorts of uh, disorders. And so you can have mutations that can occur very early in development before the separation of the germ cell layers, uh, which occurs at the time of gastrulation. And such a mutation would be present in a fraction of cells in, uh, uh, in all of the tissues of the body, but, but in only a fraction of all of the cells in each tissue. Or you could have a mutation like the yellow mutation that occurs after gastrulation and so it would be present in a fraction of cells in the brain and likely a smaller fraction of the cells, cells in the brain than the red mutation would be because it's a mutation that occurs later. Or as I'll show you, you can have mutations that are present in one half of the brain shown in green and not the other half. 
And by the way, can people see my pointer? Yes. Yes. Thanks, Tony. Uh, or there can be mutations present in a tiny quadrant of the brain or even a little slice of the brain. And then what I'll tell you about is actually, it turns out some non-clonal somatic mutations uh, can actually occur in single neurons, uh, even though neurons, as we know, don't divide uh, in the adult brain. And so I'll tell you then about clonal somatic mutations as a cause of childhood epilepsy, which is how we first got involved in studying them, uh, and where we have a wonderful collaboration here with folks in Cleveland, um, Ingmar Blumkip uh, at uh, Cleveland Clinic. I'll tell you about clonal somatic mutations uh, in some cases of autism spectrum disorders. And then, and then finally, I'll come back to these, these somatic mutations that are limited to a single non-dividing neuron. So as I say, we really got started now uh, more than 10 years ago um, due to the influence of uh, Ann Paduri, a former fellow who's now a professor herself at Boston Children's Hospital, who was interested in studying a rare condition where half of the brain is vastly overgrown and intensely epileptic. Uh, and this condition is called hemimegalencephaly. And you can see that uh, in this patient, the right hemisphere, which is shown on the left by radiographic convention, is overgrown and the gray matter and the white matter are not well distinguished. And this child had intractable epilepsy starting on the day of birth and the left side of the body was weak because of the disorganization of the right hemisphere. And so in a desperate attempt to control his seizures, uh, neurosurgeons removed his entire right hemisphere, leaving just cerebrospinal fluid where that half of the brain used to be. And this was life-saving. He had no seizures for six years. He has well-controlled seizures now. He learned to walk. He's speaks fluently, he reads at grade level. Uh, his name is Dante. I use his picture and name with his parents' permission. Uh, and um, he's, his life has been really saved by this surgery, but that also then allowed Anne to study the resected brain tissue to test the hypothesis that there might be a genetic mutation that was limited to that one bad half of the brain. And in Dante's brain, in fact, uh, she found a point mutation in a gene called AKT3, which encodes a serine 3 in kinase. And this is a specific missense uh, mutation, which is known from the cancer literature and other AKT paralogs to be an activating mutation to cause constitutive autophosphorylation and constitutive activation and to promote uh, proliferation. Uh, and in fact, um, now this is a, a, a common recurrent cause of this hemimegalencephaly. And so in the 10 years or so since uh, that first handful of cases, our lab and many others uh, have studied uh, these very large malformations as well as much smaller malformations called focal cortical dysplasias, where only one or two gyri is involved, as you can see in this little uh, bright area here in the left hemisphere of this patient. And what we find is that um, in hemimegalencephaly, there are these mosaic mutations present in the bad half of the brain and typically not detectable in other assayable tissues like the blood or the saliva. So presumably limited to the bad half of the brain and only present in somewhere between 10 and 30% of the cells, even within that lesion. Uh, and then these focal cortical dysplasias are even more remarkable because the mutation is present only in a tiny fraction of cells, one to 5% of the cells. And again, limited as far as we can tell to that lesion. Uh, and uh, there's a, now a host of genes involved uh, most of them focus on the mTOR pathway, including PI3 kinase, two different subunits. And these are missense activating mutations, typically recurrent missense alleles, AKT3 more commonly and AKT1 rarely. Uh, and then activating mutations in mTOR itself, which uh, also we see recurrent specific missense alleles. And then actually loss of function mutation in negative regulators like tuberous sclerosis and other components of the gator complex like DEPTC5. And so now we know that in fact, these, uh, this, these focal cortical dysplasias are actually the most common cause of, of intractable epilepsy in children uh, that requires surgical uh, removal. So these are not that rare of a condition at all. And every epilepsy center in the country has an active surgical program to remove these lesions because they, the seizures respond very well to removal. I wanna mention also Alyssa de Gamma who uh, worked continued this work in our lab. And there's also important work from Stephanie Bowlock in Paris, from Bill Dobbins in Seattle, from Joe Gleason in San Diego, and Jung Ho Lee uh, in Korea. And so the, the type of the lesion then reflects 
not just the mutation, but also the timing and the location of when that and where that mutation occurs. So for example, this focal cortical dysplasia has an mTOR mutation present in about 12% of the cells in the lesion, uh, uh, which is located in the frontal lobe, uh, and, uh, but not in that patient's saliva. And this patient here uh, has hemimegalencephaly, the uh, overgrowth of the entire hemisphere has the exact, almost the exact same mutation, a mutation at the same codon in about 20% of the cells. And this patient actually has a germline mutation uh, that's the same allele, but is present throughout the body. And, and the brain is massively overgrown. There are skin lesions, and this patient uh, died uh, in the NICU uh, as a young child. So while this work was ongoing, uh, Alyssa particularly was interested to know whether what sorts of other neurological conditions might reflect these mosaic mutations. And we had been studying autism spectrum disorders for several years, uh, and that is characterized by the fact that the, that the majority of the known genetic causes are de novo, meaning they're absent in the parents and present in the child. And they can represent Mendelian single gene disorders like uh, fragile X or tuberous sclerosis, chromosome abnormalities like 15Q rearrangements, de novo copy number variants like 16P deletions, or duplications, or de novo coding region point mutations in exons uh, that in specific uh, genes. Uh, we also are interested in inherited causes like recessive coding region mutations. But again, uh, so much of the disorder is due to de novo mutations. We wondered whether some of these de novo mutations might occur not in the germline and be present in all of the cells of the body, but might actually occur during mitosis, during development, the same way the epilepsy mutations arose, and so be present in a fraction of cells uh, and potentially account perhaps for the higher function cases of autism where the kids are so good at some things and so bad at other things, uh, as almost as though they had a mutation in part of their brain and not throughout the whole brain. And so the, uh, I, I mentioned some of these genetic causes of autism. One of the most important ones that we see in the clinic are de novo copy number variants, which are small deletions or duplications, which contribute to anywhere from five to 10% of autism cases uh, in a typical clinical series. So again, you can be a, it can be a deletion as shown on the left over here of this segment C, or it can be a duplication of a similar segment. Uh, and these were first reported to be important for autism now in about 2015 or so, uh, and they're now commonly encountered in the clinic. And so we wondered whether mosaic copy number variants might also contribute to autism risk. Uh, and this is work that Max Sherman, a graduate student in Poru Lowe's lab, did uh, collaboratively with Rachel Roden and Carolyn Diaz from our lab. And uh, they studied over 12,000 ASD probands and 5,000 unaffected siblings, collected as part of large collaborations, the Simon Simplex cohort and the Safari Spark collection. Uh, they, uh, po Ru is a brilliant bioinformatician who developed a haplotype phasing method, which is very sensitive to detect mosaic copy number variants, even if they're present in as few as 1% or 2% of cells when they're large. Um, and so we thought, gee, this would be great to apply to uh, these uh, large-scale DNA studies. So we're studying blood DNA, so we can only capture those copy number variants that would occur before gastrulation and be present in all of the tissues of the body. We also had to screen out copy number variants that may be limited to the blood and are associated with a phenomenon referred to as clonal hematopoiesis, which is rare in these young kids with autism anyway, but which Poru has, has been a leader in characterizing, so it was able to then uh, basically filter those. Uh, and we found that mosaic copy number variants contribute to a, a quite a small but a consistent proportion of cases, about a third or a, a half of a percent of cases. Uh, and you can see that these mosaic copy number variants are overrepresented in probands compared to their normal siblings uh, in the overall data set in both, and as well as both individual data sets. And you see that the mosaic copy number variants tend to be very large, uh, that, they, that when present in a sibling, they're usually small. Uh, and that the very large ones, larger than four megabases or so, are only seen in autistic probands. Now, these are larger copy number variants that are typically seen uh, in, in autism in the germline state. In fact, some of these uh, copy number variants are so large, they would probably kill the child if they were present in the germline. And here's just a few examples. This is a mosaic loss of the distal part of chromosome 18Q, and you can see the loss of uh, 
distal chromosome 18 here in the maternal allele and in the total genotyping intensity. And this contains a likely candidate gene TCF4, which when mutated in the germline causes a severe developmental disorder. Here's an interesting interaction of a mosaic loss of norexin 1, which is an important autism and schizophrenia gene. Uh, but it's only present in a tiny fraction of cells, about 8% of cells. But in fact, that patient also has a germline uh, start loss uh, in the norexin beta-1 isoform, uh, which in the mother uh, is not associated with any severe disability. But here we have the combination of loss of the entire uh, paternal copy, as well as a point mutation in the maternal copy, causing mild intellectual disability uh, in this 12-year-old. And then here's actually a disorder, a mosaic disorder of imprinting, where we have actually parental uniparental disomy of distal 11P, uh, where uh, in fact uh, you lose the maternal allele, which is a critical allele which has to be expressed. And even though it's replaced with the paternal allele, because of the imprinting, you still lose this critical region, uh, which is associated with a genetic disorder called Silver Russell syndrome. Now, in the germline state, there are certain copy number variants that are frequently seen in autism spectrum disorder recurrently in many different patients. Even though they're de novo, the same region is involved in, uh, in a significant fraction of patients, notably deletions and duplications of 16P11, deletions and duplications of 22Q11, uh, duplications of 15Q, and also disorders of the norexin locus and a few other loci. And so we wondered whether um, these same copy number variants might occur in the mosaic state, and if so, maybe they would cause a milder form of autism. Maybe they would occur for account for sort of higher functioning autism. But in fact, we didn't find that. We were surprised that the, uh, these familiar copy number variants that cause autism when they're present in the germline state never seem to create risk for autism if they're mosaic. Uh, in contrast, the mosaic copy number variants uh, in autistic programs are larger than the germline copy number variants, as I've already mentioned. And when you look at these recurrent loci, 16P and 22Q, in fact, they are seen in the germline state in autism cohorts uh, and much more commonly than in normal people uh, in the UK, <coughs> but in fact are completely absent in the mosaic state um, uh, in our autistic probands, and if anything, are more common in normal people in the UK biobank. They're present in a couple of normals, but so far we've never observed them uh, in our autism cohorts. And in fact, if you then look at these mosaic uh, copy number variants in normal people in the UK biobank, none of the phenotypes associated with this particular um, disorder in the germline state actually seem to be present in these patients that carry these mosaic 16P1. So the germline 16P11 loss causes defects in height, but in fact, the mosaic people don't have any problems with height. It causes fewer years of education, but in fact, doesn't in the mosaic state and so on. And so really the mosaic copy number variants um, don't seem to cause a milder version of the germline state, but in fact, the mosaic copy number variants associated with autism are just really a completely different animal than the germline copy number variants. Uh, at the same time, we've been studying mosaic point mutations associated with autism spectrum disorder. And this is work started by a former postdoc, Elaine Lim, who now has her own lab uh, at um, U uh, University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School in Worcester. And she studied, again, large available exome sequencing data sets, um, but again, done on blood DNA, so only able to detect these early um, these early copy number, these all early point mutations in the mosaic state that would occur before gastrulation. Uh, but in fact, we had large numbers. So that's the advantage where we have a better statistical power to study these events. And so what she found is that uh, if you look at all of the de novo uh, mutations that are present uh, in a child and absent in the parents, you see that the allele fraction of most of these is 50%, implying that they are heterozygous. And that means that they're present in the heterozygous state in all of the cells of the body. But then there's a fraction of these de novo mutations with a lower allele frequency. Uh, and these would be cells that are the mutations that are presumably heterozygous in, um, in a smaller fraction of cells, less than all of the cells, perhaps 50% or fewer. And that's this is what they look like in next generation sequencing reads. This is a heterozygous variant with a, a variant allele frequency of 50%. And this is a, a, a presumed mosaic uh, mutation with a variant allele frequency of only 4%. And so uh, Elaine 
showed that in fact, there's an excess of damaging missense mutations in genes that are expressed in the prenatal brain uh, in cases compared to controls. Sometimes in known uh, autism spectrum disorder genes like SCN2A, but other times in novel genes not previously implicated in autism, perhaps genes that again, when mutated in the germline state might be lethal. Uh, and these patients with mosaic mutations more often have preserved IQ than patients with germline uh, ASD mutations. So perhaps some of these, uh, these mosaic point mutations do account for some of these high function cases of autism. And there was work uh, done at about the same time from Jonathan Pevsner's group at um, Johns Hopkins, from Brian O'Rourke in Oregon, and uh, Yan Meido uh, and, and Li Ping Wei uh, in Beijing. Overall, mosaic mutations uh, seem to contribute to up to 5% or so of autism risk. Uh, so perhaps a third of a percent due to these de novo, these mosaic copy number variants, and a couple of percent on top of that due to these mosaic point mutations. Although we're still trying to define that number precisely uh, and to try to make this clinically useful. And also Alyssa analyzed postmortem, a small number of postmortem brains with autism and showed that there are also mosaic mutations at some uh, known autism genes uh, in those cases as well. Now, more recently, Rachel Roden, a former uh, student in the lab, has teamed up with Yan Mei Do and Peter, from Peter Park's lab to look at the entire range of mosaic mutations, both in autistic brains as well as in normal brains, assaying 59 postmortem autism disorder brains and 15 control brains, taking DNA samples from the uh, prefrontal cortex of both cases and controls to look at the landscape of somatic mutation and also see whether we could learn more about contribution to risk. And so we did high coverage, 210x sequencing of the whole genome to look at uh, non-coding mutation as well. And this has very good sensitivity to detect mosaic SNVs present in about 10% or so of the cells, but actually the sensitivity drops off quite quickly, um, surprisingly. And so these are mutations actually that are really only present in the first handful of cell divisions. Overall, a typical brain at that level of sensitivity has 25 or 30 uh, mosaic SNVs per brain, uh, suggesting that, that we all have uh, lots of these mosaic mutations, and they occur actually throughout the genome. Uh, they are a little bit enriched in open chromatin, shown in blue compared to uh, closed chromatin. Um, and uh, in fact, that enrichment uh, is more striking in the autistic cases here than in the controls, or that might just reflect uh, sample size. So that both, uh, so that all brains showed an enrichment of mutations in open chromatin, but actually the autism brains had more of these mosaic mutations uh, in, in, in particular open chromatin segments that had marks of being active neural enhancers, suggesting that these mosaic uh, mutations in neural enhancers might contribute to risk. And you see that over here, there are 29 in the 59 autism cases and only one uh, in the 15 controls. And furthermore, genes that were within 50,000 base pairs of these mosaic brain enhancer mutations actually were enriched for brain expression, uh, further suggesting uh, that uh, this is a specific binding. Although again, we have a very small sample size of only 59 brains. And so we'd really need to, as more brains are available, uh, replicate this in a larger sample set. And some of these mosaic mutations actually alter transcription factor binding sites uh, by eliminating uh, particular sites, for example. Uh, and some of them we showed actually do uh, impair the enhancer activity of the mutated sequence. So to conclude this part of the talk, mosaic mutations are an important cause of focal epilepsy in the clinic. This is of immediate clinical value. Uh, they cause occasional cases there are important, an important minority of cases of autism spectrum disorders. This is not yet something that is tested for routinely in the clinic, but we can hope we can get to that point fairly soon. Uh, and these mosaic mutations in neural enhancers might be a component of autism, but again, here I think we need further uh, replication in larger data sets to be sure of that before we bring that to the clinic. These mosaic mutations are typically missed when sequencing blood DNA with uh, presently available calling algorithms. Um, and uh, it's what's really remarkable is that mutations in such a small fraction of cells can cause a lot of mischief in the brain, particularly in the case of epilepsy, where a mutation in one or 2% of the cells uh, can cause intractable uh, seizures. 
So with this deep genome sequencing, we wanted to just look at what happens in the normal brain uh, as these mosaic mutations develop. Uh, and so, as I said, we found about 25 or 30 uh, mosaic mutations in a typical brain at this sort of level of sensitivity. Uh, and that actually, we, we could actually define what cell cycle they occurred in based on their allele frequency, or we could estimate that. We estimate that there are about three or four mutations in the first cell cycle, um, the very first cell division, and then an average of two or three in subsequent cell cycles. And so that predicts that a typical person will have about 80 mosaic SNVs just over the first five cell cycles. And in fact, that makes it very likely that a typical person will have uh, one that actually involves an exon and that changes the function of a gene. So in addition to the 100 or so de novo mutations in our germline we have, we have almost that many again uh, in the mosaic state. So Sarah Bozzotto uh, teamed up with Jan May and also Javier Gantz, there are two postdocs in my lab and Jan May from Peter's lab, to now say, what can we learn about the normal development of the normal human embryo by studying these mosaic mutations? So they found that there are uh, about 60 uh, mosaic, so this actually involved doing more sequencing, not just at the brain, but also the heart and the spleen and the liver, and then also sequencing single cells from um, uh, three individuals and putting together all of this data that gives us greater sensitivity to detect these mosaic mutations. Here we find that there's now uh, three times as many mutations, uh, about more than 60 mosaic mutations that can be detected just that are shared between all tissues, spleen, gray matter and white matter of brain, heart and liver. Uh, and then we can also see mosaic mutations that are tissue specific. Uh, the, lever, the liver has much more tissue specific mutations than any of the other tissues we assay, probably because the liver undergoes constant uh, regeneration of the, of the hepatocytes, which creates individual clones in the liver that are large enough to be detected by this method. And then the heart uh, has um, fewer of these tissue specific mosaic mutations, the brain actually has fewer still. The spleen uh, has the fewest of all, um, actually only about a dozen, probably because most of the progeny of the spleen gets scattered throughout the body in the form of lymphocytes. So different tissues then have different ways that they manage the clonal architecture of that particular tissue. We can also look at the early cell divisions of the embryo by phasing these mutations using single cells to figure out which ones occur in which branch of the human lineage tree. And they could reconstruct the first eight cells of the embryo. Uh, actually, we could not resolve cells five and six, but basically could determine then um, how much of each tissue do these first eight cells contribute to. And you see that cell eight contributes a lot to the gray and white matter of the brain, but relatively little to the liver. Uh, whereas actually cell four contributes a lot to the heart and less to the brain uh, and less to the liver. And so it's very asymmetrical how different cells in the early blastula contribute to different tissues. We also reconstructed these first several cell divisions in three different individuals and found that in fact, the asymmetry of the segregation of the early uh, cells uh, differs from person to person. Two people looked like they had a fairly symmetrical contribution of the first two cells to the embryo versus the extra embryonic tissues, whereas this person had a very asymmetrical contribution where actually one cell uh, generated about two thirds or three quarters of the embryo and the other cells seemed to can either die or contribute mostly to non-embryonic tissues. And then we looked at uh, all these 54 individuals and found that the symmetry of this first cell division ranges anywhere from symmetrical to highly biased uh, on a person to person basis. So none of us have the same cell lineage map uh, in terms of the contribution of our early cells to the body. And next we looked at how, uh, what can we learn about the process of gastrulation by mapping uh, all of these somatic mutations to different tissues. We find that the, as I mentioned already, the early somatic mutations with high allele frequency were present in all of the derivatives of all of the major germ la layers, uh, essentially all of the tissues of the body. Um, and then uh, later occurring mutations would have lower allele frequency. Uh, and then at a certain point, they start to become limited to one tissue uh, and not shared by all of the tissues of the body. And so this transition uh, marks then the, the time of gastrulation 
uh, when actually progenitors start becoming segregated into different tissues, uh, and that you can, and then based on the uh, based on the inverse of the allele frequency, we can estimate about how many cells are present at the time that this process takes place. We estimate about 150 to 250 progenitors are present at the time of gastrulation uh, in the human uh, embryo. Now, of course, we're neuroscientists here, and so we're mostly interested in studying the development of the different neuronal types in the cerebral cortex using this method. Uh, and excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons have very different patterns of development. The excitatory neurons tend to form somewhat clustered uh, clones of daughter cells formed by progenitors that live in the ventricular zone of the developing dorsal pallium, shown here in red, whereas the inhibitory interneurons that end up in the cortex are not formed in the progenitor zone for the cortex itself, but instead in the progenitor zones that give rise to the basal ganglia. And the neurons, inhibitory neurons, migrate non-radially all over the surface of the whole cortex. So we wondered whether similar patterns would be present in humans as well. Now, to that, for that, you have to combine the analysis of lineage, which is encoded in these DNA mutations, with the analysis of cell types, which is actually reflected in the RNA uh, transcripts that the individual cells uh, express. And so we'd like to then combine uh, DNA lineage analysis with RNA sequencing or ATAC-seq uh, to analyze cell types. And I told you that, that the, uh, the DNA mutations are somewhat enriched in open chromatin, meaning they might be captured by ATAC-seq or, or in transcribed regions, but you see that it's actually a tiny fraction of the overall somatic mutations are present in open parts of the chromatin uh, or parts of the chromosomes that might uh, plausibly be transcribed, whereas in fact, the vast majority of them are present in intergenic or deep in introns. And so they're very inefficiently captured in uh, single cell RNA sequencing or in single cell uh, ATAC sequencing. Um, this just shows a bunch of different somatic mutations and their representation in RNA-seq or ATAC-seq. And so we get very little lineage information when you try to deduce the somatic mutations from either of those technologies. Only about 5 or 10% of the cells show detectable mosaic DNA lineage marks. And so Peng Peng Li and August Huang uh, in, uh, in my lab developed a targeted method uh, where you can take single cells and sort them into single wells of a plate. Uh, and so this is a low throughput method. And then you can do targeted analysis of the DNA lineage marks and of 20 or 30 RNA markers of cell type, and then map the cell type back onto the sort of um, now traditional Tisney plot of uh, cell types. And so this shows the example. These are some of the lineage marks. These are a series of lineage mutations that occurred in sequence. The A1 occurred first, A2 occurred later, and is present in a smaller fraction of cells, and A3, and so on. And you see that A1 is present in all of the different neuronal types, the inhibitory neurons, and the excitatory neurons, although it's absent in some of the non-neuronal cell types. Uh, and then A2 is present in a smaller fraction of cells, but again, broadly in both, cell, both neuronal cell types, so is A3. And then when you see mutation A4, it now becomes restricted to the excitatory lineage shown here in the bottom. Uh, and in fact, uh, A5 is further restricted to the excitatory neurons. And that's shown for several different uh, clades of mutations, uh, where this is that one I just showed you, where it's successively enriched in the excitatory neurons here, shown in red, and depleted from the inhibitory neurons, shown in blue. Uh, and here are a couple of other examples. And then we also can determine the layer in which the neuron resides based on the DNA, the RNA markers it expresses. And what we find is that these early mutations are present in neurons of all of the different layers, but then the late mutations are actually absent in the lower layer neurons and restricted to the middle and upper layer neurons. This indicates actually the sequence in which the neurons become post-mitotic in the human cerebral cortex. The early neurons uh, in the monkey are generated first, and the upper layer neurons are generated last. And in the human, we find that these upper layer neurons contain mutations that are absent in the lower layer neurons because they occurred at an age after which the lower layer neurons became post-mitotic. So humans seem to show the same pattern of neurogenesis uh, as seen in other, uh, other mammalian species. But also the human cortex shows a very integrated clonal structure. Uh, we have basically a half a dozen, six or eight different uh, clades of 
that are generating neurons that are intermingled in a given patch of the cortex. And these uh, can be traced all the way back to being separate at the eight cell stage, as I just showed you. And each of these first eight cells generate neurons that intermingle in a single column of the cortex. In fact, we estimate that excitatory neurons are generated from 10 or 12 distinct progenitors in a patch of cortex. And the interneuron clones disperse even more uh, widely. And so this model actually would actually generate nicely what we see in the disease state, where you have a mutation that remarkably is present in only one or 2% of the cells in this little patch of the cortex. And that's because, again, the, the rest of the neurons are generated from completely unrelated uh, lineages. And maybe this is teleological, a mechanism that nature derived in order to protect the brain from these mosaic mutations by dispersing the neurons that carry those mosaic mutations widely over the cortex. And so we think in principle, we might be able to develop a somatic mutation lineage map of the human brain. In fact, you can do it for any human brain if you are not limited, of course, by cost. Uh, it's immediate, it requires no transgen. In fact, you can do it of a, for a brain of any postmortem species. You could do it from a postmortem chimpanzee or a postmortem whale uh, and determine the comparative aspects of cell lineage in the brain. Uh, it's immediate, it's quantitative because you measure these allele frequencies. It's in principle complete because it seems that every cell division is marked by a couple of mutations and it's archival. You could even analyze Einstein's brain <clears throat> Uh, which, which sits in a museum in Philadelphia somewhere uh, and see if there's anything special about the way his brain developed. Uh, of course, at the moment, it's too expensive to do this at a large scale. So I'll, uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes, I'll talk about just how much does the genome of one neuron differ from the genome of the neuron next to it in the human brain. Uh, and this uh, has depended on, a, on the development of methods for taking the genome of a single cell and amplifying it and sequencing it uh, with increasingly good accuracy. And I'll mostly be talking about single nucleotide point mutations, which are the most abundant source of this neuron to neuron uh, variation. And so now three years ago, we published a study uh, that was led by Michael Dotto and Rachel Roden from my lab and which was deeply collaborative with Peter Park, uh, his lab and particularly Craig Borson, uh, and um, Allison Barton. And we had developed a method for amplifying single neurons from the human brain, but we weren't sure if we believed it or not, because you, when you see a mutation that's only in a single cell, how can you validate it? Uh, you can't validate it. And so we wanted to try to study as many different conditions as possible to see if we could then see differences in neurons in different places and times. And so we analyzed single neurons from the brain of newborn infants, uh, a couple of four and six month old individuals, from several adolescents, several middle-aged adults, several aged individuals, and then actually single neurons from several cases of progeroid conditions where there was premature aging, including Cockane syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosa. We isolate single neurons, we lyse the, neur the nuclei, we amplify the whole genome using multiple displacement amplification, and then genome sequence uh, just a handful of of neurons, three, four, as representative, presumably, of that brain, and then use a linkage-based SNV identification. And, what, and the results are summarized in this graph. That this shows three or four neurons from the brain of one newborn and three or four neurons from the brain of another newborn. This shows three or four uh, teenagers, several neurons from each. This shows three middle-aged individuals, several neurons from each, and this shows uh, four or five elderly individuals with several neurons from each. And what you see is that there's a lot of variability from, into, from, one, from person to person and even cell to cell within the same person. However, the average number of point mutations is remarkably high even at birth in the hundreds. And actually the average goes up slowly but inexorably with age, about 20 or 25 point mutations per year. So that in the, the elderly individuals in this study had more than 2000 point mutations per genome. And so, we find that non-dividing neurons, sorry for the typo, accumulate mutations almost as fast as dividing cells that have been previously studied in the gut, the colon, and the liver using other methods. Uh, that rate of accumulation is summarized here for stem cells from the colon of three individuals, the small intestine and the liver. And there, the accumulation rate is about 35 or 40 mutations per year. So neurons are only about half as fast, but it's amazing that they accumulate mutations at all. We had no uh, and expectation that non-dividing neurons 
would accumulate double-stranded point mutations. So how does that work? How might it, mutations accumulate with age? We suspect it's because DNA damage is ubiquitous and the methods that repair it are, are very, very accurate, but not perfect. Uh, for example, if you look at nucleotide excision repair, in fact, this involves a little bit of DNA replication. So even though neurons don't replicate their whole genome, they do replicate their genome 29 base pairs at a time. When there's a single-stranded lesion, nucleotide excision repair removes the flanking 29 base pairs and then uses the undamaged strand to repair the damaged strand um, by copying it. But if you can imagine a scenario where you had simultaneous lesions on both of the strands at the same time, if you cut out one strand and replicate it, you're replicating a damaged mutation and you're creating a new mutation. And then when nucleotide excision repair comes around and repairs the other strand, it's using now a mutated strand as a template and you would create a double-stranded fixed mutation. So we, that's just one mechanism that might generate this. And in fact, um, DNA lesions are so ubiquitous, occurring maybe 10,000 to 100,000 in the cell at a time, Two such lesions being within 29 base pairs of each other is actually much more common than you might imagine, more than common enough to account for the 15 or so mutations we see per year. So then we, um, Peter Park's lab analyzed these mutations to try to get at what are the, what are the drivers of mutations. And the, this is done in cancer by looking at mutational signatures, by looking at the mutation and the three base pair context in which it occurs. For example, ultraviolet light consistently causes C to T mutations, and that's seen only in exposed parts of the body like skin and head and neck cancers. Cigarette smoke tends to cause oxidative mutations, C to A mutations, uh, and that again is seen in some cancers but not all cancers. And so uh, they analyze the mutational signature of our neuronal mutations to derive unique neuron-derived signatures and then see if these had any resemblance to uh, signatures identified in cancer that might have identifiable mechanisms. So our neuronal mutations form three signatures. We called them just A, B, and C. And signature A was the main driver of the age-related accumulation. And so you can think of signature A as an aging signature. And in fact, its closest, um, its closest cousin in ca cancer-related signatures is a signature called signature 5, which is, related in, which is seen in all cancers and which is related to nothing but the age of the patient at the time of diagnosis. Uh, and so this is a previously identified age-related mutation, but the fact that it's also present in neurons likely implies that it's present in every tissue doesn't depend on cell division. Our signature B did not increase with age and was present in all of the different neurons uh, in a similar fashion. Uh, and in fact, uh, some of these are congenital mutations due to cell division, which are typically C to T mutations, although this signature also is where uh, substantial amplification artifacts uh, actually are segregated out. So the signature analysis is nice because it then segregates the uh, amplification artifacts to this one signature. Uh, and we've actually been able to recognize that and develop newer methods that remove much or all of that artifact. And signature C then has these oxidative-like mutations, C to A mutations, as well as other mutations, and actually also has a modest age-related uh, uh, accumulation and actually uh, in, resembles a signature in cancer that has previously been suggested to potentially reflect oxidative damage to the genome. Now, when we compare our mutational signatures in neurons to those that were identified in these aging stem cells that I mentioned, you, it's remarkable the extent to which we see the same signature or very, very similar signatures. The stem cells also show a aging-related signature that has C to T and T to C changes, and that resembles the cosmic signature 5. There is a proliferation-related mutation, which is predominantly C to T, similar to our signature B. And there is a, a third signature that was attributed to possible oxidative lesions that is enriched in this C to A changes as well. Now, uh, in the last few years, in fact, mostly in the last year, there have been multiple presentations of three new methods for amplifying uh, this, the uh, genomes of single cells or single molecules of DNA. 
Uh, and we've used one called PTA that was developed by Chuck Gawad, who's now at Stanford. And this is work that's available in BioArchive. And you see that it, uh, PTA gives remarkably even amplification of the genome of a single cell compared to MDA, which is very, very unequal. Um, and, um, and our studies with PTA from the same individuals uh, show, study with MDA show overall lower numbers of mutations, but again confirms this age-related accumulation with a slope which is almost the same, or just is a little lower. It's more like about 15 point mutations per year. And then additional work done in Mike Stratton's lab compared uh, single cell signatures to clonal signatures of derived from those single cells and actually was able to specifically identify artifact signatures. And so now we can actually use that information just to to uh, subtract that uh, our, subtract amplification artifact from MDA. If you, if you, the difference here is mostly referable then to these uh, artifactual amplification um, artifacts that are, again, that are essentially absent in PTA. Sunny Shi's lab developed another method using transposases that's called MetaCS. That confirms an age-related accumulation at essentially the same rate of 15 or 20 point mutations per genome. And then a fourth uh, method developed by Inigo Martin Correa called NanoSeq uh, is not a single cell method, but also showed uh, almost the exact same rate of age-related mutations uh, in neurons. Using PTA, we've also looked at indels. And uh, because it's so accurate, we're better able to call indels. Uh, and in fact, we see that indels occur, uh, also increase with age in neurons. Uh, these are small insertions or deletions. Uh, and they, incur, they increase by about two per year uh, and uh, dominated in fact by deletions. Uh, in, uh, duplications increase much more slowly. Uh, and in fact, even though there's only about two per year, they have a, a damage of, they, they tend to damage the genome actually more than the 20, 15 or 20 SNVs. And indels are thought to arise by repair of double-stranded breaks that occurs by non-homologous end joining, uh, and that can create a small insertion or a deletion of event uh, at the site of the repair. And so these also have a, a large functional effect on the genome. And in fact, in neurons, uh, it's been proposed by several groups that uh, double-stranded breaks might be very important uh, in the expression of early neuronal early response genes. And our data suggests that maybe some of these double-stranded breaks are not fully repaired. Now, we also in investigated what happens if you have deficient DNA repair. Does that increase the rate of these mutations? Uh, and for that, we studied two different defects of this nucleotide excision repair process, cocaine syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosa. And this is work of Mike Coulter. Uh, and both we chose uh, types of cocaine syndrome and xeroderma pigmentosa that were associated with neurological defects. And these disorders also show essentially premature effects of aging, things like uh, early cachexia and early uh, development of gray hair. And sure enough, uh, both of these conditions have uh, large increases in the average number of SNVs per neuronal genome. And again, that increase actually has a specific signature. The signature A is not significantly increased. Signature B is variably increased, but signature C is the one that primarily derives this. And again, signature C uh, has been interpreted in the cosmic literature as failed nucleotide excision repair of oxidative lesions. Uh, and so our work confirms, in fact, that uh, this is likely to reflect failed uh, nucleotide excision repair. So let me just summarize what we found about age-related mutation accumulation in non-cycling neurons. That neuronal genomes add 15 to 20 SNVs per year, apparently linearly. Uh, the, you, you get a similar rate of increase if you correct MDA to remove artifact. If you use PTA, if you use MetaCS, and if you use NanoSeq, they all show similar rates. And so although we can't validate the mutations in any single cell, the fact that we see such a similar uh, rate with multiple different methods now. Uh, and uh, we see differences between different parts of the brain or different uh, disease states. I mean, it gives us a great deal of confidence that in fact, double-stranded point mutations do indeed occur as we age, even in cells that don't uh, replicate their genome. Uh, and in fact, the NanoSeq paper showed the same thing happens in smooth muscle cells. And we've seen similar effects uh, in uh, striated muscle and in cardiac muscle. And so probably all non-cycling cells accumulate mutations at a certain rate per year. The main driver is signature A that uh, 
and that these are C to T and T to C mutations. But in fact, the ultimate cause of signature A is a mystery. Uh, it's shared in cancer, um, but in fact, it's not known what causes it in cancer. Uh, it could be a chemical property of DNA. It could be, um, it presumably reflects some sort of failed DNA repair. It, we know that it's expressed in transcribed genes. So transcribed parts of the gene genome have higher rates of the signature A and uh, highly expressed genes have higher rates of it. And so it's a bit of a tragedy that the genes that our brain most relies are on are the genes most likely to be mutated. And we see a similar signature of four different methods. And then there's this age-related accumulation. Also, it shows a much smaller contribution of signature C, a couple of mutations per year. This is actually C to A as well as C to T and T to A changes. It's only seen in a few other tissues uh, and might reflect oxidative damage. And it's increased if you have faulty nucleotide excision repair. And furthermore, neurons seem to add about two indels per year but with a functional impact that's comparable to SNV. And these indels also are enriched in highly transcribed genes. And they also, our data, which we did not present in the bioarchive paper, suggests that these indels are in fact enriched in these upstream enhancer elements of neuronal genes. Uh, it's consistent with the idea that there are double-stranded breaks in the context of gene expression. And in the last then, just two or three minutes, I'll show a couple of slides on work that's not yet published on Alzheimer's disease. And this is work that's being led by Mike Miller, uh, who has uh, visited Cleveland uh, with the possibility of uh, taking a job here. And so in Alzheimer's, the pathology is now familiar, beta amyloid plaques, microglial activation, neurofibrillary tangles, and then this ultimately leads to neuronal loss. But how do these upstream um, pathologies ultimately kill the neurons? And so that's what we wanted to get at by studying the neurons in Alzheimer's disease and ask what's going on in the genome of neurons uh, in the Alzheimer brain. And our hypothesis is that maybe these upstream activating uh, processes might ultimately damage the genome and that the Alzheimer uh, neurons might show a higher rate of DNA damage uh, that might contribute then to the ultimate neuronal loss that we see. And that this DNA damage might be a way that the age, uh, which is such an important risk factor for degenerative diseases, the increase of SNVs with age might then interact with the disease-specific uh, risk factors to create uh, a faster rate of accumulation and potential loss of neuronal function. And so Mike has worked with Mike Lodato, who's a former postdoc who did the aging study, now has his own lab at UMass Worcester, and August Wong from an Alice Lee's laboratory, who's the bioinformaticians involved in this. And so we know that there's age-related accumulation in the normal prefrontal cortex. Mike Miller studied the hippocampus CA1 field, which is prominently involved in, in Alzheimer's disease because prefrontal cortex is only involved late in Alzheimer's disease. And so we studied late stage Alzheimer's disease, uh, Brock stages five and six. And you see that there's a similar age related increase in CA1 compared to the prefrontal cortex. And this is mainly driven again by signature A. But then when we looked in, uh, uh, in about six or eight different Alzheimer cases, single neurons from Alzheimer cases can sometimes show normal rates of mutation corrected for age, but frequently show very high rates of mutation compared to normal. And this is a highly significant enrichment of mutations in Alzheimer single neurons, either from the PFC or in the hippocampal cortex, and the excess is similar in both regions. And what drives this excess then? Uh, signature A seems to be roughly similar in Alzheimer and in normal. Uh, is not significantly increased, it's nominally increased, uh, and so it could be slightly increased, but is not met, but is not the main driver. The main driver, in fact, is signature C, where you see this, uh, this hint of oxidative damage. Uh, this is actually about doubled uh, in Alzheimer compared to normal. And so how do we think about this? Well, we think that age-related SNVs normally increase with age, that Alzheimer neurons seem to have a significant increased number of damaging mutations from whatever is going on in the Alzheimer brain. And hearkening back to Dave Standard's talk, uh, where we favor the idea that there is inflammatory processes in the Alzheimer brain that may release reactive oxygen species, uh, and that that could actually directly cause some of this DNA oxidation. By the way, we've re replicated our Alzheimer study using PTA, and we see similar results of an increased number of mutations driven by uh, increased 
uh, signature C. Um, and um, so again, these, these upstream risk factors might ultimately lead to non-clonal somatic mutations limited to single neurons that lead to genomic damage and uh, perhaps their death. And uh, again, its specific mechanism of signature C is not yet known, but might reflect oxidative damage. We have some evidence uh, for uh, direct increase in oxidative damage to nu nucleic acid in postmortem Alzheimer's brain. And these somatic SMVs, you can see that they actually, um, there's a large excess of functional, uh, function altering mutations in Alzheimer's brain compared to age matched controls. So just to end my talk, the, the, the neuronal genome actually is a permanent record of everything that seems to happen to that cell. It's a record of where it comes from because they retain a mark of the cell's developmental origins. Uh, and some of these developmental clonal mutations influence risk for complex neurological diseases. Uh, they're common enough so that we all have some. They may actually, uh, they may actually contribute to why identical twins are not so identical, or they might contribute uh, to um, particular functional uh, differences between neurons in our brain. They accumulate in neurons without cell division. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, in fact, they might reflect the environment that that neuron is exposed to. Uh, and then we're wondering that neurodegenerative diseases, whether they might ultimately resemble cancer, that they might reflect somatic mutation accumulation from diverse causes that might not produce, that obviously doesn't create abnormal proliferation, but might cause some form of genotoxic neuronal death. Uh, and this is actually uh, a process, this is a, essentially a mechanism proposed years and years ago uh, by many people. And so I've tried to acknowledge people who've done the work as we go, as I went along, mosaic autism work done by Elaine and Rachel um, and, um, and Jan May from Peter's, Peter's lab, the cell lineage work, a full collaboration with Peter Park's lab, Sarah Bazzotto and Javier Gans from my lab, uh, and then the, the targeted um, paired seek by Pung Pung in August. And I think I'll, um, and, and the Alzheimer work done by Mike Miller and Mike Lodato. Um, and um, we're really generously, um, we're really, really, uh, thankful for generous support from NINDS and NIMH, and I'm grateful for your attention. I'm happy to entertain any questions if people have any. Well, thank you, Chris, for that uh, just fascinating talk about so many different things. I would like to open it up for questions. I don't see anybody who's, an who's asked a question in the chat yet, so if you could please do that, that would be great. Um, I do have a question about the lineage tracing uh, to start with. So you're able to do a good temporal timing of when these mutations occurred. Have you thought about whether you might be able to uh, figure out which progenitors of the many types of progenitors one has in the developing brain of which progenitor of origin of these mutate, where the progenitor of origin of these mutations are, and then finding out whether those progenitors populate the brain? Right, wow, that's a really tremendous question. Uh, and we, uh, I mean, we, we would like to um, develop a, a dense line, as dense a lineage tree as we, as we, re as we realistically can. Um, and so, um, you know, we would see that we see clones then, for example, that are restricted to um, a relatively small region of the cortex. Um, but we can only, since we're studying adult brain, I guess we can only really deduce uh, what the progenitor mm -hmm. that that arose in. But we're very interested in whether different progenitors might have different rates of mutation. Uh, there's some evidence that epithelial progenitors have lower rates of mutation than non-epithelial progenitors. And so, uh, you know, we're, it's, it's possible, but we don't know whether mutation rates might vary over the course of development. That there might be, you know, higher at one stage than another, depending on how long the cell cycle length is, mm -hmm. how much time cells have to repair their genome. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of, there's basically, you know, a lot, lot, lot of questions that we have only scratched the surface of trying to answer. Great. Thank you. Anyone? I have a question. You know, I'm going to go home now and worry about my DNA lesion rate. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know that you looked at uh, UV exposure and you looked at smoking. I was just wondering if you looked at anything else or, you know what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. Well, um, like I said, the, uh, I mean, it does appear that there is, uh, there's, I mean, I, the signature A, so at 
the neurons accumulate mutations in these at least two signatures. Maybe as we get more and more data, the, the algorithm that defines these signatures tends to be able to parse the data more and more finely. So as we get more data, we might have more than two signatures uh, and we might be able to subdivide it into more different processes. So, you know, cancer is now up to like 60 or 70 signatures, uh, many of which are mysterious in their ultimate origin and mechanism. Uh, but um, there's something, there's gonna be this age-related signature, which seems, as I say, universal to different tissues. Um, and so I'm not sure there's anything we're gonna be able to do. And, and, and remarkably that signature A uh, doesn't increase even when you have defective nucleotide excision repair. I didn't, I, I, I said that, but I didn't marvel at how amazing that is, that, that this age-related thing doesn't even, uh, it, it, it doesn't get worse if you have bad nucleotide excision repair. You would think that faulty damage would, would accumulate signature A ones, but it doesn't. Uh, and so I don't know what, how we're ever gonna prevent that signature A from accumulating. But it seems that, you know, signature A accumulates, but it doesn't necessarily kill you. You know, uh, maybe if we live to 140, it would kill us. But that, you know, you have a thousand or 1200 signature A mutations, but in fact, they're all through the genome. And so a tiny fraction of, of them affect the exome. Uh, and so relatively few of them are function altering. Uh, but then, you know, you add something like this signature C or Alzheimer's disease, you double or triple the number of mutations. And then it's more likely that a larger number of neurons will actually have function altering changes that will impair their function in some way. So the signature C, again, we don't know exactly what it is. It looks like there might be an oxidative component. It's plausible that, might that that oxidative component might relate to some sort of reactive oxygen species related to inflammation. And so that's kind of what I'm betting on. Uh, and, uh, and I think that would be consistent with, you know, so much other work that suggests that reducing brain inflammation then it, you know, is probably good for us. Uh, I just don't know how exactly to do it. You know, whether eating blueberries is gonna be enough, uh, uh, but th that, that's where I would sort of put my money. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the alternative is worse is if you don't age, you, you don't have anything to worry about. That's right, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, can I? There sounds like there is one, please. Can I, can I ask a question, uh, Chris? That, that's, a, that's a fascinating talk. It's a, so the, um, my question is, um, if we assume uh, two neurons or, or neurons that come in from the same lineage, they migrate towards the same direction, you know, same destination, et cetera, uh, the, the mutation rate between the two are different or, or, or the same? The, um... Well, uh, the, the, are you referring to the developed? So, you know, what we, the way we think of it is that every neuron is born with a set of clonally of clonal mutations. Yeah, you show the upper yeah. layer neurons seems to have uh, more mutations right. because they migrate longer, but presumably. Yeah. Exactly. They, right. During the, the migration, numbers. they divide maybe a couple more uh, divisions. That's right. They undergo more cell division. So the upper layer neurons actually have more highly damaged genomes uh -huh. uh, than the lower layer neurons. Because so the lower layer neurons if you compare them. two of them, the yeah. mutation numbers and the rates are similar or different? Sorry, if I compare two neurons, well, if I compare neurons to deep layer neurons? Yeah, I yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess to a first approximation, they would have about the same number of neurons. And then upper layer neurons, we haven't studied this system sufficiently systematically. Uh, uh, because we didn't realize it when we were sorting the neurons, you know, that if we want to do lineage trees, we should sort the upper layer neurons because they'll have all the most interesting late occurring mutations. Uh, right. Whereas the deep layer neurons, we shouldn't bother sequencing them because they'll only have the, the, they'll have a stunted set of mutations because of their early withdrawal from the cell cycle. I see. I Is mean, um, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of a depressed, so, the single molecule approach for us to study any pathological mechanism is over, isn't it? Based oh, on your study, it seems like, uh, you know, there's a somatic mutation, even on the wild type background. I mean, it's just like, it's unbelievable complex. It is complex. I'm not, I wouldn't throw out, you know, too much too quickly. Um, it's just something else to keep in mind. Uh, but, you know, to, to your point about um, 
the, the, the our different neurons have the same numbers of mutations. Uh, work that Javier Gans is doing on glial cells is really cool because he um, <clears throat> He's studying the age-related accumulation in glial cells is about twice as fast as neurons. And in, in glial cells, we see an ongoing accumulation of a proliferation-related mutational signature, whereas we don't see that in neurons. Neurons, the proliferate, I told you that signature B is flat regardless of age, because for those that are non-artifactual are acquired at the time of birth and stop uh, being generated, but that's not true for glial cells. They have the C to T signature that continues throughout life. But what's neat about the glial cells, he's, he, he found two glial cells that were part of the same lineage. Mm. Uh, and so uh, he could trace back by estimating the number of SNVs uh, that occur per year in non-cycling cells. He could use those signature A mutations to actually um, determine how old the person was when those two glial cells separated from the lineage, right? So they shared all these clonal mutations and then they had a lot of unshared mutations. And so he could count the clonal mutations and he could count the, the non-clonal unshared mutations and use the unshared mutations to extrapolate back, you know, based on them accumulating at, at 20 or 30 per year, uh, how, you know, that in, in one case, the pair of cells diverged uh, a couple of years after birth, and in another case, the, the cells had diverged before birth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. I don't, again, I don't see any other questions. Uh, I just want to thank you again for a great talk. Uh, and Eleni or Lind, any closing comments? No, that's it. I think, right. uh, well, thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. I, I would like to, well, closing comment, uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you. You know, David and Andrew Pieper, the you know, uh, Kathy okay. Schultz and Asaf for the wonderful talks. And thank you everyone in the audience for participating. Chris, we'll invite you over sometime next. Right. <laughs> COVID is over. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thanks again, Good Chris. Forward. Okay, bye. Eleni, uh, Eleni I wanted to mention, I, uh, we have a shared connection with oh, Peggy good. Holiday, with Peggy Holiday, who was oh. my, yeah, at the university, when she was at the University of Chicago, I was a graduate student there. What a wonderful person. And you know, she left University of Chicago to come to Bryn Mawr, and Bryn Mawr. had she not done that, I never would have crossed paths with her. She was amazing. So, oh, well, I'm honored to have anything in common with you, so <laughs> thanks. Well, great, great to know you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>